So in this last segment, we're going to move into probably uh, an area that's, uh, again, moving away from the castration-resistant prostate cancer space to this very narrow space, which many people believe we're going to see more and more of, these patients that present with metastatic disease, metastatic prostate cancer, but are hormone naive. They've not been exposed to androgen deprivation therapy. And there have been two, two reported trials over the past couple years that have specifically addressed how we might more appropriately manage those patients. So, Jorge, tell us a little bit uh, in the time remaining about Chartered and Stampede. Yeah, so, so I think that uh, I'm excited about the oral therapies. I think the oral therapies are great, but I think that to me personally, uh, the use of early chemotherapy has drastically changed how I practice, you know, and, uh, and basically there are three main trials, you know, is the French data, uh, the ECOG 3805, which is so-called the charted data, and recently the UK data, so-called the Stampede data. So let me just talk first about uh, the ECOG data. The ECOG data was a very simple trial. You know, we medical oncologists to some extent are very linear. So uh, if you have an agent that works really well in the advanced setting, the question is can you actually move that agent even earlier? And there is some biologic rationale to use those attacks earlier in that context, uh, animal models and so forth. So what the ECOG group uh, set out to do was to actually uh, address that a very specific question. If I start with at front those attacks, would I change the survival of those patients who are hormone naive, so-called hormone sensitive or castration sensitive, right? So there was a randomized phase three trial in the United States, 790 patients plus, randomized one to one to either ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, or androgen deprivation therapy and six cycles of docetaxel-based chemotherapy using the standard dose of 75 milligrams per meter square. And prednisone was not required in that trial as we did for uh, the TAX 327 and SWOC 9916. The primary endpoint of the trial was very simple, was actually survival. And to me, the survival is, is quite drastic. If you look at the overall uh, patient population, there is a 13-month difference in median survival in favor of those men who actually went on to get ADT and docetaxel. You know, so from that data itself, I learned two things. Number one, that I can see a patient and look at that patient straight in the eyes and tell them, if you have metastatic disease, your median survival is 44 months, because that's the median survival for advanced disease in that context. And if you get chemotherapy at front, then you can improve that median survival by 13 months. The hazard ratio is 0.61 in that context. Now, the biggest controversy that we have perhaps about uh, the ECOG data uh, is uh, who's worthy for chemotherapy. And by that, I mean uh, we did a, a pre-specified analysis looking at volume of disease, uh, low volume patients or high volume patients. And if you look at the median survival for low volume patients, you know, the median survival for both arms has not been reached. If you look at the median survival for patients with high volume metastases, there is a 17 month improvement uh, in favor of those men who actually have uh, at, those attacks at the front. So that has actually put a lot of pressure in the system because the question is, how do you define volume, right? So volume has been defined in many different ways over the last 15, 20 years, but the definition and chart I used was simple. If you have visceral metastases and or if you have more than four bone lesions, one of which out, it has to be outside the, skeletal, the vertebral or the pelvic region, right, you are high volume, anything else or everybody else is low volume, right? And that to me, you know, uh, is, is concerning, although that definition has, has a stand time because SWOC 9346, in the past many other trials used the same definition, and clearly we know high volume patients still benefit the most from those therapies. So just to be clear, that is a definition that has been used before in Correct. clinical trials. Yes, we have. Because I think, I think people yeah, need to understand We, we that. have used that definition. So when you look at the, uh, the, the charted data, there is no doubt that adding chemotherapy at front drastically impacts survival. The question now remains is, low volume, to low volume patients go on and get systemic chemotherapy. Now, the Stampede data actually look at a very, very same patient population. It was a 6,000 patient trial in the UK with a very clinical trial design that allows you to uh, move and exchange agents that were interesting when we developed the uh, trial, but over time have become obsolete, right? In that context, they use celecoxib and many other things. That data has been reported in two ways. The median survival for those patients who were randomized to ADT alone is, again, 44 months reported last year or the year before. 
and the median survival for those men who actually have systemic disease who move on to either ADT or ADT plus docetaxel again. Again, a set up, the overall patient population was a 10-month survival improvement, but when you take the patients with M1 disease, those patients with metastatic disease, there is a 22-month median survival improvement in favor of those who receive ADT plus docetaxel-based chemotherapy. Now, what has created, again, the, the complexity of understanding this data is the previous French data, JETUC15, that actually was exactly the same that charted, looking at ADT against ADT plus chemotherapy, and in that trial, even updated analysis this year, there was no difference in survival for those who got ADT plus docetaxel compared with ADT alone. So the biggest question is how come the French data is negative, and yet we have the American data and now the UK data demonstrate a significant survival improvement? And those are the, the questions that we have there right was a now. Difference well, one, in the it was, of, there were 300 patients and 350 patients in, that, in the French trial. That's the first thing. It was less power to that study. And I believe there's a lower cumulative dose of docetaxel Correct. delivered as well. Correct. I think that you know there's a lot of uh, ways to dissect the, the French yeah. data. Obviously, one is sample size, but I think perhaps the biggest one, in my opinion, is what uh, many others have actually uh, discussed in the past, which is when you look at the timing of when G215 was, was conducted in the down. French region. Guess what? <laughs> we didn't have any of the raw agents approved right. in the uh, in the in, in the in, in the French system. When we finish charted in America. Abi was approved, Ensign mm. was approved, Cavacitaxel was approved. So a lot of patients moved from that at front chemotherapy and went on to receive subsequent uh, therapy, whether it was oral therapy or mm -hmm. Cavacitaxel. So, so in other words, a patient who is on the control arm of Charted may have progressed, and he progressed at a time when subsequent therapy Correct. wasn't available because Abby and Enzalutamide weren't approved. Whereas a person who got the chemotherapy, mm -hmm. not only did he benefit from the chemotherapy, but, but he also, Correct. that, that window yeah. opened where yeah. he got, was right. able to get yeah. abiraterone. Yeah. 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 Plus also in Stampede, didn't they, sh didn't they show that the addition of bone targeting therapy, and I believe they used zoledronic acid, yes. did not add that did not change the And that had been shown in a U.S. study as okay. well. So, so I, I hope that that part of the, the, the trial actually settles the question as to whether or not patients with castration-sensitive disease with bone metastasis deserve to be on a bisphosphonate. In my opinion, the answer is no. So mm -hmm. it is fair to yeah. say that when you look at ADT alone in the Stampede data against ADT plus, plus solendronic acid, the combination of solendronic acid and ADT was superior than ADT alone. But then if you look at ADT plus chemotherapy against ADT, the median survival you know, was far better, mathematically speaking, compared with the median survival on the ADT solendronic acid alone. And therefore, in my personal opinion, I do not believe men with castration sensitive disease with bone metastasis mm -hmm. need to receive bisphosphonates or rank ligand inhibitors for a skeletal related prevention. One, that's one thing. The other topic is whether or not they need bone health, you know, and whether or not we should actually be using uh, some of these agents to prevent and minimize bone loss. But I think the concept of putting people on solendronic acid at front, I think that that should be. Uh, and yet it's happening all the time. Correct. Right? Because in, in the breast cancer world and in the lung cancer world, and oncologists are putting patients on the bisphosphonates early on. So it's not uncommon for me to get a referral from an oncologist, and those patients are already on those therapies. There are patients who have very extensive bony disease at the time of diagnosis, and, and some of the subset analyses suggest that those patients may benefit. So I don't look down on that. Yeah. It's just the one or two or Correct. three bone met mm -hmm. patient. I don't think they you know, I think from I think in terms of charted, and I was, I was speaking to somebody about this, wasn't about 25% of patients on charted had actually had their primary already treated. Yes. And so, you know, as, as a urologist, mm -hmm. we would be very interested in looking at that population. Right. You, you know, what does that particular phenotype look like in terms of when they progress relative, you know, what was their Gleason at the time of radical, you know, you know those types of things.